Confucius? I'm not. Never heard of him? No. Uh, no. Chinese mathematician? Close enough. I'm going to tell you some of his famous sayings and leave out the end and let you finish them. Everything has beauty, but not everyone has brains. It's beautiful. What are you saying? Forget injuries, but never forget to eat. <laughs> Pain. <laughs> A name. I like that. Be not ashamed of who you are. Why should you be? Okay. Wait, I am. Oh no, I need Confucius. I don't have all the answers either, but I'm here to find out. Welcome to the hub and to the birthplace of Confucius. Whether you're a fan of his teachings or not, you cannot deny the fact that 2,000 years on, this man remains a singular cultural figure, and his influence is felt through boardrooms, classrooms, and living rooms around the world. This is a ritual dating back since the 1980s. People came to the hometown of Confucius to celebrate the life of this ancient Chinese philosopher. It is officially known as China International Confucius Cultural Festival, taking place every year in Qifu, Shandong Province. This year, 2021, marked the 2,572nd birthday of the Chinese sage. Alongside the Confucius Festival, the 7th Nishan Forum on World Civilizations also took place. 180 scholars from around the world attended the forum, where they discussed the relevance of Confucianism in healing the wounds of modern societies. As a native of Shandong, coming home to attend the forum was so dear to my heart. The topic of our discussion was on how different civilizations can learn from one another. Ye Xiaowen, deputy head of the Committee on Culture, Historical Data and Studies of China's top political advisory body, CPPCC, lamented the state of affairs, acknowledging that although mutual learning among the world's civilizations is desirable, in the reality, the world is seeing clashes of civilizations. His comment echoed the scholarship of Samuel P. Huntington, who argued that in the post-Cold War world, it will be cultural differences instead of economic and political ones that will set people apart. The outspoken Chinese official put it bluntly that the global battle against COVID-19 has been challenged by a political virus. He said China has useful experiences to share when it comes to containing the virus, and the global community should work with China to get through this together. Roger T. Emmes, better known in China's academic circles as An Luozhu, said that Western cultures value principle and justice, whereas Chinese culture desires harmony, which leads to win-win scenarios where people are not just individuals competing in zero-sum games, but community members working towards common interests. Yang Huilin, former vice president of Renmin University, explained the concept of harmony without uniformity. He believes this approach is key in bringing together different cultures as it emphasizes similarities while recognizing that each culture is unique. After the dialogue, I sat down with Ye Xiaowen, the senior Chinese official at CPPCC. Looking at reality, do you think civilizations can really coexist, or are they bound to clash? Now there is a force in the world which is globalization. The United States wanted to develop its economy and at the beginning promoted this trend. But now it seems that the United States is more interested in upholding its leadership position in the world. Stirring up tensions with China and its allies is one way to do that. But hegemonism is dangerous. In the first half month after 9-11 happened 20 years ago, I wrote an article explaining that hegemonism and terrorism reinforce and counteract each other. The practice of hegemonism gives rise to terrorism. So the U.S.-led wars on terror can't kill all the threats, and not to mention its enormous military expense. 
We are indeed facing a challenge from a reverse trend of globalization, a global order determined by how powerful a country is. But the development of globalization can't be stopped. Only through peaceful dialogue between all civilizations can the conflicts between countries and people be mitigated. How would you explain to our viewers from around the world that China is not a threat? Because that is a very prevalent point of view. The United States now believes in a theory, the Thucydides trap. This Roman historian wrote a book called History of the Peloponnesian War. Taking ancient Athens and Sparta as an example, their competitions intensified and both eventually fell apart. Now, in the United States, many people fall into this Thucydides trap. President Xi Jinping has pledged that China will stay on the path of peaceful development and pursue a mutually beneficial strategy of opening up. China has no intention to replace the United States, and the Chinese never want to threaten anybody. The perception of China is getting increasingly negative, uh, like it or not, if you look at Pew Research or Gallup polls, pointing to the reality that in Western Europe and America, uh, more people than before hold negative uh, views towards China. Why is that, and what can China do to reverse that reality? First of all, I do not think we should adopt an all-or-nothing approach to many misunderstandings in the West that you have just mentioned. The United States is a developed country, and I believe there are still people there with calmness and rationality and can reflect on what's going on in the world. If a country becomes extreme and fanatical, its foreign policy will lean towards fascism, and domestically it will become more divided. I hope the U.S. will not go down this road. What can the Chinese culture, the Chinese civilization, offer to the rest of the world when it comes to um, you know, healing the wounds and solving the problems of today? China's 5,000 years of civilization has explained that China's rise is peaceful and that Chinese culture allows differences in harmony. Chinese people do not stir up troubles, and we are not cowards when involved in some. As Mao Zedong said after the war to aid Korea, when organized, Chinese people can't be messed with. The Lishan Forum includes some topics that we discussed and revives Confucius's knowledge. Events like this communicate to the world that China is not a scary opponent to the world and values peace. Confucian ideas still contribute considerably to the world. On September 28th, the Xinchou Year Public Memorial Ceremony for Confucius was held at the Confucius Temple in Chufu, Shandong, a site listed by UNESCO as intangible cultural heritage. One would be surprised to see how many people actually made their way to the event. It was a solemn occasion. Scholars, officials, and tourists walked through the temple with the Analects of Confucius being read in the background. And that is a collection of sayings and ideas about ways and virtues of life. We are really happy to be here uh, to uh, celebrate the 200, 200-500 2,572nd uh, uh, birth anniversary of the Confucius. Earlier, I got a scholarship of Confucius Institute to come to Chongqing and learn the Chinese language. Uh, so one year I was learning Chinese language and then I went back to my home country, Sri Lanka, 
and then I came back uh, two months ago to Beijing, and then now I am working. So, what quote from Confucius do you like the best, or what uh, what about his teachings that yeah, actually, do you like? Uh, actually, the Confucius teachings have uh, done a tremendous. Uh, uh, impact on Chinese people's lives. So there are so many uh, analects and so many uh, quotes from the Confucius. Uh, so uh, because we already received the book of all his uh, quotes, so I'm going to read it and maybe next time I will, uh, in Chinese language, I will repeat several for you. But in general, mm -hmm. um, which part of his teaching mm -hmm. do you think? inspired people yourself yeah, I, uh, most. I think uh, uh, Confucius has uh, taught uh, many things to get the lives of uh, people better especially the students and how to uh, learn better uh, and uh, I think uh, as students what uh, his teachings uh, can do uh, a lot of things uh, to improve uh, the students' life. Is Confucius famous in Sri Lanka? Yeah, of course, because uh, in Sri Lanka we have three Confucius institutes, uh, and in the future we will like to uh, get many uh, uh, Confucius institutes in Sri Lanka because uh, the uh, the cooperation and collaboration with Sri Lanka and uh, China is blooming. So we have many Chinese people working in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, so but many people fear the Confucius Institute is probably perhaps bad uh, in America. Uh, uh, but uh, in Sri Lankan perspective, uh, you know, we are all in Asia, so we have to uh, work together. As uh, the President Xi Jinping always says, uh, we have to work together for for a better share future. So Sri Lanka is always with China uh, to cooperate for cultural cooperation, for language cooperation and everything. So in the future also uh, we would like to do more uh, to learn the language and also uh, share our experiences and for better future. Students from local universities also showed up wearing traditional clothing with a modern twist for many. It is important to memorialize the man who offered so much wisdom to the Chinese culture. Uh, Sanjay 我挺喜欢的，因为他觉得，我觉得他可以把一个人的道德品质素养提升一些，嗯，因为你是那个中国的传统美德，啊，因为他就他的一言一行以及啊以及流传下来的一些文化一直都在影响我们后辈。How does Confucian thinking inspire Chinese policymaking? Can the East and the West finally get along? I sat down with one of the guests in attendance, Li Xikui. He's the vice president of the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Given the reality of global geopolitics and the interests of countries, um, do you believe there's still much room for people-to-people -people diplomacy or people-to-people -people exchange to um, improve relations between countries? I think COVID-19 has made everyone realize the world is indeed a global village thinking of it as a community of shared future for mankind. And it is impossible for anyone to exist and thrive in a vacuum. China has many institutional exchanges with foreign countries, for example with the United States, 
Sister cities in the two countries maintain close relationships. There are many communication mechanisms now, among which I think culture and education are pivotal areas. For example, we have the China South Asia International Cultural Forum. In the course of our exchange, everyone is talking about Chinese traditional culture and the influence of Confucian culture in their history. So I think events like this have played a great role in cultural exchange. As President Xi Jinping noted, telling good China stories is very important. I think this is an area of improvement for some of our institutions. How can we show the Chinese people's good characteristics and how to make our stories relevant? Are questions we bear in mind? Increasing media coverage and getting our voices heard might be the first step as we aim to change the Western world's stereotypes about us. What should the world know about Confucian ideas? When we attend the Nishan Forum this time, I think we can have a deeper understanding of Confucian culture. I think Confucian culture is broad and profound and should be well promoted, especially in international exchanges. Confucian culture includes a lot of universal values that are still relevant to us today. And I think it's very important for us to think how we can promote it. Traditional values such as wisdom, respect and trust in the Confucian culture are very practical to many countries. China's ideas for development, for example, building a community for shared future and harmonious symbiosis can find references in Confucian culture. On one hand, on the non-governmental diplomacy level, the work we primarily do is to interact with people. President Xi Jinping once said, friendship, which derives from close contact between peoples, holds the key to sound state-to-state -state relations. Focusing our work on the individual level is very important. On the other hand, Every country has its own culture, and I believe countries should be open-minded in sharing their distinctive culture with others. There should also be more tolerance of differences. Non-governmental diplomacy can play an important role in bridging cultures. My name is Devi Afilia. I'm a counselor for social information and culture in Indonesian Embassy. So how do you feel being here at the Confucius Memorial Ceremony? Oh, I'm uh, very honored because, you know, I'm here to learn about the civilization. And we are here in the birthplace of the Confucius uh, Master. So it's an honor for us. Chile is the farthest country of China in the world. So coming from Chile. Uh, I am very proud to, to tell you that uh, Confucius is known in the normal regular people in Chile. The projection of Confucius in the world is huge, is big. I know, I know him how, uh, as a teacher, such a, such a teacher, but I don't know more about him as a philosopher. So, Maybe this event also can help me to understand that. Confucianism is very open, you know, to different uh, civilizations and try to harmonize all the values. The 2021 UNESCO Confucius Prize for Literacy announced its winners during the China International Confucius Cultural Festival. The program was established in 2005 with the aim of recognizing individuals, governments and NGOs worldwide in expanding education to regions and communities where illiteracy remains a problem. This year, three programs from Africa and North America were the winners. And Shems University in Egypt organized online literacy classes to empower learners in rural areas. Local students are encouraged with incentives and training programs to participate in the project as teachers. 
the Association of Literacy Teachers who use information and communications technology in Côte d'Ivoire helped females working in trade improve their reading, writing, and the rhythmic skills through the use of information and communications technology. The Building Growing program provides construction workers and their communities in Mexico with digital literacy education available on multiple devices and create an immersive learning environment for them. International students studying in China were also invited to this year's cultural festival. For many, this is an eye-opening experience. Now I'm interested in just uh, know more about China because the the civilization of China is for like 5,000 years, so it's it's perfect, I think. So I try to know more and um, understand more about China and Chinese culture. It still has that knowledge that he shared with us so long ago. It still has like some use in the nowadays society. You can see that in Chinese culture, you can see that his values in the family, the Chinese family, and even in some aspects of the government. I think if maybe other countries could also apply this kind of uh, cultural knowledge, maybe they will upgrade themselves, like maybe my country. But right now is the perfect time because it's not only Chinese students, it's also another uh, country students, so we can share experiences. <laughs> As a native of Shandong, to be honest with you guys, I've been coming to the birthplace of Confucius since I was probably six or seven years old. But this is the very first time I'm here as a reporter. Super excited, super thrilled. I can't claim that I understand everything about this man, but I certainly learned a whole lot more about this ancient Chinese philosopher. I hope you have enjoyed our show. Thanks for watching this episode of The Hub. I'll see you next time. There is uh, one I know and I love so, so much. I, I'll say it in Chinese. It's um, Ji Suo Bu Yu. Wu Shi Yu Ren. I'm tearing up. Uh, it makes me feel homesick because as much as I miss home, uh, I have found a home here for the past three years. So, yeah, it's a good quote. I really like that Thank you.